Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Steph Yardley with us today. Hello, Steph. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all. Well, virtually. <laughs> <laughs> and where, where are you located at, Steph? Um, so at the moment, I'm actually in Birmingham visiting family uh, just at the moment. Um, but Very cool. I'm, yeah, normally I'm in Edinburgh. Okay. Working remotely, <laughs> even though I'm at the University of Reading. So uh, a <laughs> bit of a story there, but yes. Um, Two way functions yeah. all over the place. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Place. Very good, very good. Um, and how's summer? Is it hot, wet? Yeah, well, luckily the weather's um, improved <laughs> right now, but it's been a bit of a washout over the over the summer. <laughs> yeah. um, but the last couple of days, yeah, it's, it's improved. <laughs> yeah. So, so got to get out there. Good. Uh, let's see. And it is August 16th, 2023 as we record this. And I'm in Phoenix and we're definitely warm. Um, <laughs> we're just starting to get our, our summer rains. This is when it rains in Phoenix is in the summer. So we get these things called monsoons. Uh, and so oh. we're ramping up into that, to the wet season in Phoenix in the summer. But yeah. it's all good. It's is it hot and humid? How hot? Is it hot and humid? Uh, in the summer is when the humidity goes up. Yes. Uh, so typically we're in the, you know, 40 C range, something like that. Uh, and then the humidity will drive up in the, in the summer. Um, and then it goes away sometime around September is when the winds will change. And so all that moisture goes back out. And so then we're dry again, but hot. <laughs> so very good. Uh, and Steph, uh, what do you like to do for research? Um, so I study the sun. That's my particular area. And uh, in particular, what the article is about is the solar wind. So essentially connecting what we see either in space or at Earth um, to what we observe on the sun. So essentially tracking these plasma parcels as they reach us or reach spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. And that is going to bring us to this yeah. very awesome APJ supplement article. It is open access. It's the open access era, people. You can go get a copy for free. Go grab one. Slow solar wind connection science during solar orbiter's first close perihelion passage. And Steph, take us away. Yes, so this paper is essentially about uh, all of the, the hard work and planning <laughs> that went into uh, planning the solar orbiter observations during its first close passage to the sun which was in March uh, 2022 now uh, so yeah. a, while, a while ago now and yeah there's a whole bunch of planning that has to go into the observations particularly if you're trying to do connection science so if you're trying to measure um, plasma at the spacecraft but right. then also observe the source region that it comes from particularly because the images not all of them are full disk they don't take uh, full sun images, so okay. you need to fit your source region. And there's a lot of people ac across the world, um, all on the instrument teams, who work very hard, and the project scientists at ESA as well, um, that cool. work very hard to try and plan all this in advance, from nine months in advance, six months in advance, because we only have these uh, partial disk images, and also we have uh, these... 10 day three times 10 day remote sensing windows every six months um and so everything has to be okay. planned uh meticulously so this paper is about the planning uh the results that we got and the observations we got from this particular um operate uh, operation plan as we call them for solar orbiter um mm -hmm. on solar wind and so there were two windows that we looked at um beginning and mid march yes there we go, in March. Very nice. Okay. So let's get into it. Do you want to cover the intro? Should we go straight to figure one? Let's just go straight to the figures. <laughs> go straight show, to the, show the pretty images. Pretty pictures. Let's do a pretty picture. Here we go. And this is sort of geometry projection. There we go. Okay. Ooh, this is actually... So, yeah. Okay. Yes, this is just the figure um, explaining part of what I've just said that we have. Um, this is the orbit of Solar Orbiter for this period 
and we had three remote sensing windows so you've got the yellow uh, the ready brownish color and the blue um, and it shows you the distance um, that we are from the sun that solar orbiter is from the sun and okay. so for these sets of observations um, so there's loads of different observations that have been taken by solar orbiter with different themes and topics and science goals and this one was the slow solar wind and so we had two windows one was during the first remote sensing window between the third and the sixth of march and so the orbiter was at a distance of about 0.5 au yeah. so halfway between the sun yep. and the earth yep. and then you can see that it moves around slightly away from the sun earth line to the second window yeah. um when we had five days of observations between the 17th and the 22nd of march and we're closer in uh, yes. to the sun but off the sun earth line this time and so those were the two sets of observations that we planned and that we we took during this this time what happened um, to uh rsw3 <laughs> other observations were taking place um we can't oh, okay. be too greedy um and yeah we so we had a we had a set time of three days during the first window and then five days during the second window and to try and um answer the goals obviously solar orbit has about four different science goals then we have different types of observations going on so for example another one is the long-term active region so you track a an active region or a sunspot on the sun for 10 days uh -huh. um so yeah so there's loads of different people planning observations so these were the the kind of time slots we we were we were given um and that we plan the observations for very nice very nice i also like that you <clears throat> this figure has some of the other uh, yeah solar instruments on here so you can get a sense of where each of them is relative to the other very nice yeah and that and that um that comes in with the planning so if certain um satellites are in quadrature there might be a certain science goal that we want to do with that or mm -hmm. uh, we might want to look at eruptions from the sun from two different perspectives so it, it there's a lot of uh, a lot of effort and time and planning that goes goes into these observations and we just we kind of decide what we're going to do when and when would be the best time to do it. Very nice. Very good. Okay, so that's our geometry of where we're at. Yep. Um, we got some observing plans. Yes, so these are just the details of the observations that we took mm -hmm. uh, with the different instruments and what trying to uh, what goals we're trying to achieve. So our main goal was to observe this um predict where we're going to observe the solar wind plasma mm -hmm. uh, arrive later, what source region is it going to, to come from, um, and look at specific um, models of solar wind formation and release. So okay. we look at the, we think that slow solar wind comes from these open closed magnetic field boundaries where yeah. you can get um, plasma that's along closed field in say active regions that can then be released through uh, reconnection onto open field that is connected to say solar orbiter in this yes. particular case um, um, and so that's what we wanted to look at um, how can we measure this plasma later on can we predict what region it's going to come from and that's when the modeling comes in and then can we observe specific features that point to how it was released uh, on the very sun? cool very cool nice okay this is the overall ones Here's some of the instruments, SPICE is one. Yeah, so there was the 10 different instruments that were involved. Uh, very cool. Um, and what their, um, uh, what their observing modes were. <laughs> I, and you can go through it and then. Good. So yeah, yeah and then this we get is part that. of the, go on, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, this is part of the planning that occurs six months in advance rather than say like three days <laughs> in mm. advance where you're trying to pick the target. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Get all those instruments going. Yep. And all it aimed toward the magnetic connectivity. Yeah. So this is what we need uh essentially to know or to try and predict so that we can say, okay, look at this particular source region because we think this is where the solar wind plasma will come from uh a couple of days ago when we'll reach the spacecraft. So it's all predicting yeah. about how it's what's connected, magnetically connected to the spacecraft um, cool. and what solar wind will arrive from what region. Okay. Um, so we have a model to do this. 
mm-hmm. um, that has been specifically designed for solar or you, you can use it with other things but particularly with solar orbiter itself and it will tell you where where we should be connected to in advance or if later you want to analyze some data that you've got at the spacecraft so like the in situ plasma and magnetic field parameters then you can say do we think we solar orbiter was connected to the region we think and so right. you can use that for predicting and post analysis so both are in this in this paper okay very cool very cool I didn't realize you could predict where any reconnection was going to happen. Well, essentially, you, you're more predicting the the source of where you think the wind will come from. Right. Um, and so, I mean... Obviously, you must do a pretty good job or you wouldn't be here doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I must, I, admit, <laughs> I must admit we did uh, a pretty good good job despite some of the difficulties in uh, doing this because you have to tell solar orbiter three days in advance during these planning meetings oh, yeah. where yeah. To point. you have right. to give them coordinates and we'll see this later on in some of the figures um yeah you have to give the coordinates three days in advance so you have to predict okay uh what region will we be connected to okay. in three days time is it going to stay there? Is it going to move? Will we have to change the target in a couple of days' time? Yeah. And, you, and then you hope for the best. <laughs> yeah. All right. Because you can't change it then. And so these are the um, very short-term planning updates, they're called. So you have meetings with uh, project scientists from ESA, and then you give them uh, you give them a coordinate, and then they go, okay, yeah, we'll send that coordinate to the spacecraft, and then we'll point yeah. there in three days. <laughs> Cool. I didn't. I didn't realize there was such a uh, relatively small time window on which this was operating. So very good. Yeah, it, it varies from the you know six nine months ahead planning what observations are actually going to take place and what modes are going to pl- take place, who's going to do the observations, what time they have because obviously you have these limited windows and everyone yeah. wants to do fantastic science in those windows. So it takes time to figure out well how many days do you need you know uh, what what do you need to to carry this out what kind of uh, observations from what instruments and then that that plan gets built in what we call the soup kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so the solar orbiter operation plan uh, kitchen and yeah. everything's built up and it's a lot of it's a lot of work from many different uh, instrument oh, teams yeah. and you have to take into account the telemetry as well because you've got a limited telemetry and yeah. data storage and so it's like this fine dance of figuring out what we can and can't do and then pl- in those planning meetings we have to get it under the amount of uh, data you know we have to get it at a certain rate um and so everyone has to agree and so this takes time but then you've got the short-term planning where you literally the scientists say who are in charge of this particular plan say i want to point at this thing on the sun cool very nice wow okay and then we have the uh well, let's go to figure two. Let's take a look at what some of these look like. So these are solar orbiter tracks. Okay. Yeah. So this is the tool that I was talking about where you try and predict what region on the sun that you'll be connected to. And so this is the um, mm-hmm. this is a, a Carrington map. So technically it's mm-hmm. a full Carrington rotation of the sun. So 27 days. So this is actually in time as well. Um, right. you can see all yeah you can see all the regions uh, the positive and negative polarities on the sun these are our active regions right. and it's just showing that um before the um the observation window that the the solar orbiter was connected to a variety of different active regions so you can see in the the northern part there's this cluster of mm-hmm. yeah there mm-hmm. black and white so yep. it's initially initially connected there um, for for slow wind, and then it moves down towards this decayed region in the in the south. So you can see this red and green dots here. These just show right. the, whether it's whether we're considering slow or fast wind. Okay. So that slightly changes the prediction depending on whether it's. We take the two extremes, so whether it's 300 kilometers per second or 800 kilometers per second, and that affects the the connectivity, it affects the what we call the Parker 
the shape of the Parker spiral from the sun. Yes. Um, yes. But so we were re relatively convinced that for the first, so this was for the first window that we would be connected to this region in the south because we were connected there a rotation before the observations began and we were going to be connected there during the time period. So for us, that target was this active region, which has an active region 12957. So that was for the first window in uh -huh. the start of March. Okay. And then, but the sun's more complicated than that. So that one was pretty simple, but for the second window of observations, uh -huh. um, the activity changed a lot and it was very difficult to pick targets for solar orbiter. Um, yeah. And so you can see that here with the, the red dots of the, the connectivity points, they they shift over time. So this was a oh. few days leading up to the planning. So you can okay. see it's in, in a negative decayed field region, then it goes towards the, the poles and mm -hmm. then it crosses the, so the, the red line is the, the current sheet where you change polarity. Mm -hmm. uh, it crosses that yeah. to a region in the north so it's very chaotic and it was, it was very difficult um and in fact unlike the first window we had we ended up with two targets because it was very difficult to determine the connectivity ah, and this okay. was particularly because the sun was a bit more lively and more active so okay. lots of regions uh emerging onto the sun and so it was changing a lot and affecting the the connectivity in the tool yeah very cool yeah, so it made it certainly more fun to to plan during that window. Uh yeah, because you're very time sensitive, right? Very good. Yeah, so every day it was we were having we were having um these telecons and instead of being like a five minute yet yeah, point at this thing that we find and we were having all these conversations. Well, do we stick with this region? Do we move? What 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 do we do? Um, but it worked out in the end. Yeah, very good, very nice. Okay. Here's the connectivities and we slide through. Oh, here we go. Target selections. So these are actually showing the, the selections we made. So the way that we do it is we have these meetings and uh, we give a, you can see the coordinates there. We give a longitude, a latitude and a, and a time frame that these were taken from. Yeah. And we use this this tool called jhelio viewer which is really cool it's interactive and it lets you load images of the sun and take a look it's great for science it's great for outreach um for looking at images and movies and so here in the first two uh, in the first column you've actually got the low latency data that we loaded in from solar orbiter eui okay. to choose choose the target and where we were going to to point at and you can see the um the white boxes are the different um instrument field of views okay. and so you might yeah. just be able to see the white dot in the middle is like the center of the the field right. of, the view uh -huh. of the instruments uh, and so yeah so in the first column you have white we're dot. looking at these uh yeah zoom in so as you can see this is the active region that I was talking about in the Southern Hemisphere for the first window. So this is basically a few days in advance what the the um, the field of view coordinates that we sent to, uh, the central coordinates that we sent to Solar Orbiter. And you can see the um, connectivity points in the red mm -hmm. and green. So it looks like we're connected to that region uh, yeah. in a couple of days time. So that, okay, fine. Okay. And then, yeah. Okay, good, I'm with you. Uh-huh. Yep. And then if you look on the right, these are the actual observations um, from EUI again in a slightly different passband. So you're looking right. at the one symbol here. And so you can see the full disk image like before, um, but you've got the, the EUI uh, high resolution image um, of the, the region um, in the middle. And then you can see again, this is the connectivity uh, right. point. Okay. But this is this is post observation. So this is where we think we observed the solar wind coming from. Got it. So, it, so it looks like, okay, maybe we caught the region during that window that the solar wind was coming from, which was great. Very cool. That was um, cool. Yeah. And then the, the second shows the same thing, but we changed, you can adjust the pointing slightly. So, if, so if you want, you can change it by a couple of degrees just to, oh if the connectivity points change and that's exactly what happens so we're just showing a later a later date 
Mm. So the first one was the third, and the second one was the the fifth of March, nearer the end of the three yes. three and a half day window. Two days, mm, yeah. Okay. Cool. Very nice. Ooh, we have oh, a good so far. <laughs> point over here. We have a stray connectivity point over here. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, it's not. You're not going to know the exact region on the sun that you're connected to. It gives you a spread of connectivity of what is the most likely points that we're connected to. And obviously that changes with time. Yes. Yes. Very nice. Beautiful. Very beautiful. Yeah, it's great to look at the uh the the images from Solar Orbiter. Yeah. <laughs> um, very Good. nice. Fantastic. Okay. And then we go into the target selections on how we picked all those and then we come to other target selections for RSW2. Okay. Yeah. So this this was the second window in mid-March when we had five days. And if you remember, I said the, the connectivity was a lot harder to predict. Yeah. Um, and so mm -hmm. there was a, a variety of different places to look. And in this particular case, we decided right. to we well, can see the, the red connectivity points are quite near the limb quite near the edge yeah. of the sun so you haven't really got a good view and it was in a location that didn't really shout slow solar wind is going to come from this region it looked more like a closed field region yeah. okay. um, and yeah. so we de decided instead to look at while we were, we were waiting for the connectivity tool to update and um, for the sun to calm down a bit we looked at the polar the southern polar coronal hole mm -hmm. um, which actually ended up being ex extremely interesting because there was a really nice eruption uh, and you could see the the dimming this dark patch associated with the eruption merged with the dark coronal hole ah. and so that that led to a different project uh, which one of our phd students picked up and wrote a paper on which cool. is also uh, in App J, um, about this really interesting eruption and dimming event. And it was so interesting because it didn't close back down afterwards. You expect this oh. dimming associated with the eruption to be tr very transient, but the corona hole changed shape for about 72 hours. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah, so, so we actually, despite the fact that the connectivity was difficult, we still caught some very interesting phenomena and, in, and interesting data from that time period. So that was the first two days that we looked at this um, this coronal hole and and mm -hmm. filament eruption. And then during the second part, um, you can see in the bottom part of the panel, we again were looking at the uh, active region boundary where you get this open closed. Mm -hmm. um, configuration so that's actually the positive polarity of a, a small decaying um, active region okay. and we looked at that i think for about three days yeah from the from the 19th onwards cool. and again i think there's another there's another paper about the properties of the solar wind uh from that region and the and the source region um in apj as well uh, by a postdoc from UCL as well, so well, it was actually quite uh, quite productive. <laughs> I will, quite productive I will, uh, these observations. Yeah, I will find those articles and I'll put them uh, in the uh, uh, text below the, the video, so you can check out those um, a little easier. Very cool. Okay, so those are our targets, pluses and minuses, the high resolution RS one, and we come to the data. From soup, the soup kitchen. Yeah, so this is these are the really cool <laughs> images from uh, Solar Orbiter um, and also SDO. So you can see the different um, the okay. different viewpoints that we have. So this is the first window with the active region in the south. You can see the different instruments. Um, so you've got the extreme ultraviolet imager, which is on the the right hand side as well. So you can see this. Ah, um, yeah. you can gotcha. see the image from, yeah the blue box correspond, corresponds to figure c and you yes. can see these really high resolution uh loops of the active region here and then you and then below you've got the associated magnetic field so this is the just the uh, line of sight or z component of magnetic field so negative and okay. positive polarities okay. actually see that there are a couple of active regions here it's it's more it's got more complicated magnetic field configuration um, and then you 
also have the the spice observations below which is what we use to uh, make composition maps and measure the composition because one of the key things you can do is measure the composition of the wind yeah. that you're measuring and look at the composition uh, in that region and if they are well correlated then you can say that it came from that region nice. um, so nice. yeah so this just shows you the high resolution uh, images from the uh, three different uh, instruments that we have and then just the view from the solar dynamics observatory as well mm -hmm. sdl mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very good okay i'm with you good okay there's our remote data talked about rsw2 and then we come to the high resolution data from soup okay yeah so as I said, this was a bit more complicated and we had the two targets. Mm -hmm. And so in the middle, again, you have the full disk um, image from EUI showing you what you can see from Solar Orbiter. And then in this one, it's more obvious because you're away from the sun Earth lot and you can see yeah. you're at a different angle com compared to SDO. So you can see what you see from Earth and what you see from Solar Orbiter, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. different perspective. And yeah. yeah, you can see all the different uh, instrument field of views and you can see the two targets. So um, mm -hmm. on the left hand side, you have the data taken from the polar region from the coronal hole. Yes. Uh, it's a lot quieter there, um, but you can yeah. see, <laughs> yeah, you can see in the um, in the EY, you can see this uh, this dark region, which is where this uh, this dark plasma ends up erupting and then, and then uh, the remnants merge with the coronal hole um which you can see in the bottom bottom left corner um but you can see it's a lot it's a lot um yeah a lot quiet so and you yeah you can see the dimming in the spice observations mm -hmm. yeah you're in yeah exactly right and then on the right hand side you have the the decayed active region um and so you can see that uh eui um you've got the you've got this polarity uh, that you're looking at in the open loops um, mm. from, from the active region polarity. And it's a lot more decayed than the previous region. You can see it's a lot, the magnetic field's a lot less strong. Right. Uh, and then again, you've got the, the spice observations uh, corresponding. And you can see actually that while we plan with the fields of view overlapping, that's not actually the case. They're slightly offset from each other and so you don't actually know what you've observed until you see the data <laughs> you see it yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so so the the one of the mo most exciting parts about it is when the supers when your observations have run is like when you can get your hands on the data obviously you have to wait for the data downlink and then you have to wait for it to be prepped and and then uh, i'm constantly asking instrument teams can you show me something i want to i want to see what we've what we've caught um yeah, so that's, that's an exciting part. Anticipation. Yeah, I think it's yeah. worth mentioning here. I mean, when you're looking at spice, you're basically looking at a ratio of magnesium to neon, various ionization stages. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's something um, that we'll follow. We'll follow up on in another paper <laughs> about mm -hmm. timely composition. Oh, we will. We will come to that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, coordinated more and the uh, Hindosat iris. And we come to the Hindo EIS observations. Okay, very good. So, yes, so if uh, coordinating 10 instruments on solar orbiter isn't enough, you can also coordinate other observatories. It, it, so, other, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I also, um, we also ran some observing plans on the Hinode mm -hmm. uh, satellite. Yes. Um, and then also IRIS. Um, and so, I think there was 14 different instruments in the end <laughs> to wow. keep track of. <laughs> Um, but this is just showing some of the right. um, Hinode uh, data, uh, particularly taken by the ICE instrument. So again, these are things like uh, yeah, Doppler velocity, non-thermal velocity, and it's just looking at right. uh, yeah, looking at the uh, the second region um, because unfortunately, I think Hinode was off during the first the oh. first window. But these are the two 
two regions. So you've got the got uh, coronal hole and the coronal dimming, and you've got the active region again. And then yeah. you see some really interesting features, particularly in the Doppler velocities. Yeah. And again, these, um, if you want to know more about the signatures, in particularly in the Doppler velocities, then the two papers that I mentioned earlier include um, a more detailed analysis of the Hanode data and the interesting outflows that you see um, in the active region, for example, and also the changes that you see throughout the um, the eruption that we get near the, the coronal hole. You see right. different signatures in the Doppler velocity and it right. changes over the 12 hours of the eruption. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Beautiful. Beautiful. Better to have 14 instruments than one. <laughs> or none. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, very good. <laughs> Might be painful to coordinate them. Um, yeah, well, that's the benefit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's the benefit as well. Yeah, it's the benefit of having um, doing observations along the Sun Earth line because because of the orbit of solar orbiter, it actually becomes more complicated during um, other uh, perihelion. Yeah. Um, to do anything else, you just you're looking at the far side of the sun, so you have nothing to help you um, look at the regions or you have no not necessarily you don't have any supporting observations maybe say parker solar probe if it's round there it depends on the configuration right. of the instruments but nothing from the around the sun earth line right right okay good okay and then we move into overview of iris observations let's zoom out a little bit so we get a global and then we'll zoom in as need be. Still with me? I think she froze. Yeah, I can see. So yeah, again, this is just um showcasing the iris uh, various different data sets that we took uh -huh. iris and these were still, yeah, so you can see the three different targets. So Iris observed all three different targets. So the active region, the coronal hole, the, mm -hmm. and its boundary, and then the other active region. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just showing the the silicon uh, velocities and non-thermal velocities. And yeah, this is something we need to, we've got so much data now that we need to oh, well. <laughs> um, ana analyze the data in more detail. And, what, and one thing would, yeah, one thing would be to look at here would be looking for signatures of uh, the interchange reconnection that you see in the source region between the open closed yeah. magnetic field. But yes. again, this is, this is a future, <laughs> future work or, um, I guess, yeah, we, we have so many data sets, it takes time to look through them all. And one question, since I don't know what this is, what is DN per pix on these silicon uh, silicon four futures? What is DN? What is the units? That, or what is it? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. It is the, again, I didn't make this. <laughs> I need to remember. Um, we go down. Yeah, don't see it there. Anyway, something per pixel. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's measurements per pixel, essentially. Ah, okay. Um, okay. I, it, yeah, it, so. It figured out. It's all good. The answer essentially right. signal. Yeah. Okay, good. And then preliminary data analysis as we move into seven. And we come to the SWA pass mag data. Okay, let's go back, zoom that out a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so these are essentially the preliminary results. So we planned, planned the observations, we took the observations and were we actually connected to these regions? <laughs> Did we measure a solar wind from this region? So this was from the first remote sensing window and the tool um the connectivity tool post analysis uh, okay. says that yes we were connected to the region that we were observing uh and that we measured a solar wind speed of that at that particular moment of around 500 kilometers per second so that was what was used Very in good. the tool 
um, to calculate the arrival time and stuff like that. And then on the right hand side, you can see um, basically there's a lot of open magnetic fields. So the pink pink lines are basically the potential right. for reconstruction. Um, and you can see there's a lot of open field there where plasma can escape and yep. spacecraft. And then the the next one is the magnetic field from the magnetometer on board. Yeah. And so we want to know, is this positive or negative, inward or outward? Does it match the region that we were looking at? Yeah. And in our case, the radial magnetic field is negative and the connectivity points from the um, connectivity tool says we should be connected to a negative polarity of an active region. Yeah. And so that, that matches up. And mm. then we look at also, finally, the... Um, different components of the velocity uh, mm -hmm. which were measured by the solar wind analyzer and you can see the solar wind uh, varies from about five six hundred kilometers per second and then to quite slow 300 yeah. so we think we're measuring fast and then it's gradually decreasing to uh, slow wind and then the the Color, colors just essentially represent this was when remote sensing window one uh, happened so it was between the third and the sixth and then this is uh okay. the arrival or the period we think solar wind was arriving from that region thanks to what the connectivity tool says so um the preliminary work looks good that we were connected to that mm -hmm. region or the nice. interval. yep but again there are many data sets to analyze and that's something that you may see later on this year. <laughs> Good, um, very cool. I look forward. Yeah. To so it. this, so yeah, so this is just the initial. There's, um, there's, a, there's the electron data to look at as well. That tells you directly about connectivity, and also um, not just the electron data, but also the composition data from the HIS instrument. So there are many things that you can you can look at, but this is just, I guess, a, a sneak peek. Uh, the initial results yeah a sneak peek <laughs> it's, a pre it's a preview it's a movie preview of the main event yeah. <laughs> there's nine and we got one more and this is uh rsw2 same layout just waiting for it to catch up a little bit so this is in the second window we got some pinks and some greens going on on the field lines here still with me Still with me. <laughs> there you are. Still with me. Yes. Yeah. So this is very, uh, very similar to the first. Right. Uh, and you get roughly about the yeah, same, just, um, that same radial velocity. Yeah, yeah, I'm still with you. I'm just waiting for. Yeah. It to right. appear. Yeah. We, we got oh, there a, we go. A little bandwidth lag. We're good. Yes. But here B is positive as opposed to yeah. the first one it was negative. So this is just the same for the second window. Um, right. and what we saw is during during the second we'll hang. Okay, we're good. Yeah, so this is exactly and this is what we'd expect from this window because if you look at the connectivity in the uh -huh. uh, the part A of the figure, then uh -huh. then the points are in the positive magnetic field. So you uh -huh. ex expect a, a, a positive. And so what you actually see during this window is the fields uh, positive. And then in the middle, you see you see this sharp decrease around, yeah. I think it's the 20th. The and that's the arrival of a of a eruption um you can see the sharp change in the magnetic field and cool. then it's positive again for the rest of the window so yeah great that matches the the connectivity tool nice. um which is what we'd expect yay. so this region looks promising as well then then again yay and then we measure similar wind speeds um mm. and we see it, de it decreases almost it's quite low to 280 i think kilometers per second mm -hmm. yeah it gets a little similar lower similar yep yeah and uh yeah and then we we have the same so the remote sensing window this time was five days and then we think for the last uh the last couple of days um just just before the, the end of the window and then a couple of days after we're measuring wind 
from this small active region. So this is number one, two, nine, six, seven in the in yes. the figure A. Yeah. So this is hopefully coming from the positive polarity. Uh -huh. So yeah, so uh, we managed to hopefully capture solar wind from two different regions from the two windows. Um, so it was quite successful in that sense, considering it was the first time we'd done it as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a steep learning curve how to how to plan it all, how to how to, you know, what what data to collect, what observation plans to run, and yeah, how how would we predict this in advance? Well, my congratulations to the team. Very nice, very cool. And so we get there a little bit more summary and discussion. Wanna wanna maybe attempt to wrap up on everything that came through, or are we good? I think we're good. I think the the key is that we managed to, Do you it. know, we have these <laughs> soups where we plan the observations for solar orbiter and we can coordinate with satellites. We got these amazing observations, um, not necessarily always what we expected, but yeah. we managed to capture at least two out of the three regions that were connected to solar orbiter at that time. And yeah, this is ongoing. So um, this was the first run. Um, the first two runs in March 2022. Right. We had another go uh, in March and April this year. Cool. So I'm still waiting for some of the, the data to have a look at. I've seen some of it, but um, yeah, we, 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 we did the same thing again. Um, this time, one of the windows was on the far side, oh, which nice. was interesting, the yeah. far side of the sun. Yeah, very nice. And very cool. yeah, uh, yeah. So now we're we're now now we're waiting for that, and then there'll be a fast wind observation campaign which will run run in October. Okay. So looking at mainly coronal, uh, coronal holes. Very nice, cool. Steph, I want to thank you so much for walking us through this awesome APJ sub article on the very first stuff from Soup. Uh, first data coming off. Very nice. Very nice. Thanks and you, kind of, you yeah sure and you kind of touched on it there i mean this is almost a dangerous question to ask but um, um given given what's going and you kind of touched on it a little bit but um uh you know so where do you think this goes you know sort of globally maybe over the next couple of years obviously you're going to have more data coming down you're going to be doing a fast wind uh data set um so what is what is the lifetime of the instrument and where do we go where do we go from here well, we we I mean we still got a couple of years left until then the orbit inclines for solar orbiter, which I think I can't remember now whether it's twenty twenty five that it starts to incline in three different steps. So at some point we'll be in the extended phase of the mission. It will be thirty three degrees out of the ecliptic, okay. which will okay. be really interesting because then we can image the poles, which is something we haven't ooh, uh, ooh. done before. Right. But I think until then we're going to be trying to understand what what the data is telling us because you know new instrument well new a new satellite with 10 instruments on board complicated data we're, we're we're learning quite a lot from these first uh data sets that are coming down and so i think up until we have new and more observations of something completely different we'll be still working on these ones that we've just taken well at least i i am and other collaborators are still working on these data sets very cool so hopefully will appear soon <laughs> yeah well it always takes a little bit of time to do that research so it's, it's all good yeah but, uh, particularly when you put all these data sets together it takes time yeah Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It takes longer than one thinks or one hopes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Always does. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, I really look forward to seeing uh, this data and this uh, instrument uh, evolve over the next couple of years. It'll be very exciting to, to see some um, new perspectives on the sun. So very cool. Very cool. Me too. <laughs> Stay tuned. Thank you. And that'll do, everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.